We regularly confess the Apostles' Creed as a part of our life of faith. It's an important element of our confession, and there's a lot going on in just a few words. The Creed is helpful, though, because it it boils down who God is and what he does for us, both here in time and there in eternity. And it's neatly broken into three articles, three parts that speak of each person of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God, as Father and Creator, that's pretty easy to understand. God speaks, and the universe is. He looks over us with a fatherly love and care that preserves us until the last day. The Holy Spirit sustains us through our faith life and guides and directs us through the church in baptism and as we gather together in worship and in our lives together. The Holy Spirit even prays for us, as St. Paul says, with groans beyond words. And then there's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that's where it gets a little odd. Because one of the hardest things for Christians to understand is the incarnation, the enfleshment, the embodiment, the eternal Son of God becoming man. And how is it that the Son of God can become man? Jesus Christ, the the God-man, is 100% God and he's 100% man at exactly the same time. He's not half God, half man, part of each, but both completely at the exact same time. He's not two boards glued together, but totally and completely, 100% all the way God and man. It's like taking 12 ounces of black cherry and 12 ounces of grapefruit and pouring them into a 12-ounce glass and still having only 12 ounces. Except Jesus is 100% God, so he's infinite and he fills all of creation with his presence and there is no place in the universe where he is not. So that's a terrible analogy. But that's the danger of trying to science this out. Trying to use reason on that which is given us by faith. It's really hard to get it into your head how it is that the Son of God, who is spirit, can take on flesh and become man. But that's what the Word of God says, so that's what we trust. Or as the Creed says, we believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, and so on. And that's what's important. For us and for our salvation, he became man, that he voluntarily set aside his divine majesty to live our life, to experience our pain, to feel our grief, to die our death. And this is what the incarnation of the Son of God means, that we don't have a God who doesn't know what our lives are like. Rather, we do have a God who knows exactly what it's like to live on this earth, because he did. He did feel the pain of our rejection and the warmth of love. And in living this life for you, he was able to be the only person in history to remake your relationship with God so that you need not fear eternity away from him. We are the pro-life generation. That's what today's high school and university students are calling themselves. Why are youth for life? Lutherans for Life's Why for Life community helps answer the question. Why for Life engages and equips today's learners to be tomorrow's leaders through education, networking, and service. Learn more about bringing Why for Life to your church and school at whyforlife.org. That's the letter Y, the number 4, L-I-F-E dot org.